Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to go. our church. Good morning. How are you all today? Look at someone and say they look marvelous. Don't lie, but you know. It's so good to see you. You know, this morning, I want to talk about a word we usually have problems with, especially in our culture today. It's called trust. Trust. Trust is a very difficult word today because... So many of us have been hurt by someone, gone through circumstances or situations, and somehow someone has broken the trust, and because of that, we now live our life on guard. And so today, we're going to talk about trust in the times of trouble. How many of you ever had trouble one day in your life, just one day? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The, the reality is, the reality is that there's a lot of problems in trust, people trust. But the thing is, people say, hey, I love God, but I don't really trust him because they, they don't give God the time, but they'll give everything else time. But they won't give God to trust God in our day and life. I, I want you to recognize how many have ever experienced job loss or a divorce, breakup or illness or death of a loved one, financial crisis. Or how about your family or even your friends? They don't support you in a time that you're going through some major struggles and you feel all alone. How about if you're facing the feelings of rejection and loneliness or people have been unkind to you? How about if you now have experienced a natural disaster or your house catches on fire? And there could be so many things that you can experience with relationships. And before you know it, you don't like to trust because, well, I've trusted once before and I've been hurt. But I will say this. Have you ever trusted the Lord and has the, has the Lord ever brought pain to you as you lived in him? And I want to explain this because, see, so often when the pain comes, we sometimes quit. When the pain comes, we sometimes blame God for it and not maybe the circumstances or the situation you're in or maybe the decisions you've made that brought forth the problems and the pain. I was thinking, and I said to myself, how many people accomplish something great and yet continue to stay in the ball, ball game? I was thinking, how many like baseball here? You like baseball, okay? I, I see those hands. So I was thinking about, Lord, who has the best record of the best ball record of home runs? And so I looked it up and I found out that Barry Bonds has 762 home runs. Pretty good, isn't it? And then Hank Aaron has 735, 55 home runs. And then Babe Ruth has 714. 
Man, those, that, that's a great testimony of look all these home runs. But let's look on the other story because they didn't quit when they failed. They stood in the ballpark. And trust is staying in the ballpark, trusting God in the equation. But doing your part. Someone say your part. Everybody want God to do his part. Well, God, take care of it. Take care. I'll tell you what. God will not take care of it if you're not doing your part. Because as we look at Barry Bonds, 600, 762 home runs, he also struck out at the plate in his career 1,539 times. Hello. You say, well, that's just Barry Bonds. Well, let's go to Hank Aaron. He, he, he's known now for 755 home runs. But he also struck out 1,383 times at the plate in his career. And Babe Ruth. 714, that's a great number, but he struck out 1,330 in his career. See what happens is these baseball players get to a level and broke major records, but they did not quit in the equation. The problem of our success in God and even in life is that we end up surrendering and quitting on God when God's trying to get our attention and we're like, God, um, I, I just don't want to go there. And what happens is we quit and we don't trust God when it gets hard. If I was to ask you this question, how many wanted to quit one time in your life? And I said, raise your hand. I bet you almost everybody in this room would have raised their hand about quitting about something. There's a quote out there. No one knows who wrote it, but I like it. It said, let your faith be bigger than your fear. Let your faith be bigger than your fear. Amen. Hebrews 13, 6 says this. So th the Bible says, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. Some say, I will not be afraid. In order for you to say you're not going to be afraid, you need to know you can trust the Lord. What can man do to me? I love that. Because when you understand that you have one life to give, and you need to, and I need to know that we need to understand God's in the equation, but we've got to give him room to work. Look at your neighbor and say, room to work. So this morning, I want to talk to you about trust. I want to take a look at the heart struggles of David. He's not king yet, but David went through a lot of problems. I was thinking the other day, and I was just kind of having a conversation with the Lord, and this came to my heart, and I want to share it with you. Life is sort of like seasons. You go through a lot of seasons in life. It's also made up of many chapters. And sometimes there are some chapters that take place, things take place in a chapter that we think that God has left us. We think that, God, what are you doing? We have more questions than we have answers. And the problem of having more questions than answers, we think God has left when God hasn't left. Because as the little footprints in the sand, it's, that's when he's carrying us. And that's why we only see one set of footprints and not two. Because what a great question when you read the footprints in the sand. Where were you, God, when I had tough times and good times? I could see you. You were walking by my side. But in the tough times, the footprints leave, and I only find one set of footprints. And so the Lord says, that's when I was carrying you, son. You see, sometimes we go through these chapters that we go through life, and sometimes it's hard, and someone breaks our trust. One of the major things in dealing with youth is the factor of trust. Today's kids don't understand trust because there have been people next to them who have broken their trust or have done things that they shouldn't have experienced even at young age. But here's David. God has called him to be king. David kills a giant that's nine feet tall. The prophet goes and anoints him as the next king of Israel. And God picks David over all his seven brothers. If you have a pen and you have some paper, write this acronym for trust. Totally reliant upon Savior's timing. Totally reliant upon Savior's, this, our Savior's timing. Savior's timing. I want you to understand something. God has perfect timing. 
There are some times in life and stuff that I've been through some stuff, and, I, and I'm like, you know, Lord, I don't get it. I don't understand why, 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 why. But I wait a little longer, and all of a sudden I see his answer. I'll give you one that comes to mind. I've shared this once before. I remember I had major, God put us through the rink when we were in college, and this happened numerous of times, but this one time I really kind of lost it. Me and God would have some talks because things were really tough. Things were really hard. And, and everybody was knocking on my door or calling me up and saying, hey, hey, where's the payment? Where's the payment? If it wasn't a medical bill, it was another bill. It was just from one thing to another. And finally I said, God, and I really kind of had it out in a sense with the Lord. I was really, I, my voice, I had a tone in my voice. Can anybody understand that when you have a tone in your prayer? <laughs> I was very real with the Lord. And I was complaining, complaining, complaining. And we're talking a lot of money that, that let's say it was really one of them with the hospital. And because we had so many incidents between our kids and my wife, I forgot how many surgeries and things, serious things that God that happened and God came through over and over and over again and, and, and some major miracles. My wife is my wife today looking the way she is because God did a great work uh, in her life. And there's a great testimony right out of the doctor's words. That tumor was not just supposed to do what it did. But how many can say, but God. And that happened two weeks when I first left, sold everything to go halfway across the country to finish my schooling. And then the enemy comes in such ways to try to bring discouragement and to bring you down. But someone say, you got to know who your God is. Come on, say it like you really mean. You got to know who your God is. See, when you kind of know who he is and you go through a circumstance or a situation, yeah, you feel the pain. Yeah, you hurt. Yeah, you're a little, you feel the pressure upon your shoulders. But you know that you know you know that you're not alone. But in order to, but in order to get there, you have to go through some stuff to learn about the character of God. And so we're going to take a little bit today, and we're going to talk about trust in the times of trouble. And we're going to look at David, because he is now going to be anointed to be the next king. David's coming back from battle one day, and the people would always sing as they had triumphed. And it was very spontaneous singing in the culture. So one person would start singing one thing and another person would sing it and they would make a song. Well, that song was Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And from that day, from that day, Saul wanted to kill David to prevent him becoming the next king of Israel. And all through the life of Saul, from that moment on, Saul had one ambition and that was to kill David. Now, I want you to understand something. We're going to look at this for two weeks, this week and next week. But I want you, we're going to look at the David's heart because we're going to look at our own heart. We're going to discover the level of trust David had, and we're going to look at the level of trust that we have in the Lord. We say we trust the Lord, but when we go through some hardships, do you really? Because when you complain, it's very lame. You tell me one good thing complaining does. No, now, I'm not picking on anybody because I know some of you are just complainers. You're, you're at the counter of complaint 23 hours out of 24. Now, I understand some things are not the way we like them, but complaining never does anything about it. What makes them to do it is prayer and, and putting your hands to the plow to see what we can do to make it better. So we're going to look at our own level of trust in the process. And lastly, how we too, how can we grow in our relationship so that our trust can be constantly growing? Everybody wants to be close to the Lord, but no one wants to put the time into it. Everybody wants to know the author, but nobody wants to read the book. It doesn't work that way with God. It's like relationship. You have a good relationship, it's because you put the time into it. If you do not put the time into your relationship with God, you will not be close to God. It's that simple. If you put your time into everything else and God gives you success, God allows success to come your way, but you do not have success in him at the end, it's going to be very empty. It is not going to be very fulfilling. Not to mention those around you as well. Because our job here on earth is to impact and influence the ones that are around us. 
If, you're a fa- if you are a dad or a mom, your first thing is those children. Though they're the main, main thing. What you do will affect your children for the rest of their life. If you're a grandpa or a grandma, listen, the greatest thing is really a grandma and grandpa because they, they'll, talk, they'll listen to you, especially when they get teenagers, more than they'll listen to their parents. It's just facts because you're outside the box. And you like, hey, buddy, it's all you now. It's fun time for me. <laughs> Every grandparent needs to know it's fun time for us. It's about, time, you know, when you're trying to raise them up, man, it's all about teaching them to be all that they need to be. But then when you have grandparents, when you become grandparents, now it's about fun. Man, my, my living room sometimes is full of toys. And I just leave it there. That would have never happened <laughs> in my younger days. Ah, they're only toys. Uh, the other day I was playing with one of them. It was so much fun. <laughs> Let's look at our portion of scripture today. We're going to look at Psalms 57. So if you want to read on top or take out your Bibles, you know, it's not a crime. Hello, it's not a crime to bring your Bible to church. Come on now. And if you still have, amen, I see that Bible. I see those Bibles. Amen. You know, my thing is this. A bi- I, all right. I, you, your Bible could be on your phone. It could be on your, your laptop. It could be on your iPad. Listen, whatever you, you do, I still, look a, I still like a book. But I'll be honest, I'm on electronic Bible more than I am on, 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 on paper Bible. But you, whatever it is, bring it to church with you. Bring it everywhere you go. Put it on your phone. Someone say Amen. Let's look at Psalms 57. Let's read. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me. For in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I cry out to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who wholly pursue me. Selah. God sends his love and his faithfulness. I am in midst of lions. I live among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They spread out a net for me, for my feet, and I bow down in distress. They dug a pit in my path. But they have fallen into it themselves. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Awake my soul. Awake the harp and the lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. For great is the love reaching into the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over the earth. Someone say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ah, when David is writing this particular psalm in 57, he is in a very difficult place. Saul is trying to kill him. The army of Israel is trying to kill him. He had people who were trying to bring him down. When was the last time you had an army that all wanted to kill you? You want to talk about a bad day. But we complain about the littlest thing. But David had some real problems. But listen to the heart. A heart that's trusting in the time that's difficult. Because the circumstance is not dictating who he is. The circumstance is driving him to the one he knows. It's important. So that's why here at the church, we are doing our best to help in all of us understand that we first have to go upward and then go outward. If we don't go upward to God, how can we be the vessels to go outward? If we're not getting... Uh, our nourishment from heaven, we're not going to be able to give it outward. You can't give what you don't have. Someone say amen. amen. So we must, on a, we are, someone say we're on a mission. mission. We're on a mission. We're here to make a difference. We're here so that God can do something in us and do some great stuff in us as we yield to him and continue to go upward and then go outward. So we go up to Christ first and then we go out to others. We grow then. We grow in Christ. And because we grow in Christ, we now grow in relationships with others. 
And then we start to serve Christ. And as we serve Christ, we're serving others. Because you want to know the best way of loving God? Love others. And then ultimately, you start to go and you go share the truth with people. And then from the next step, you go and make disciples where the disciple can make a disciple and the church of God can be healthy and strong. You see, David is seeking God first. And then, as you know, he becomes the king of Israel and goes outward. You got to do the same thing. I got to do the same thing. We got to go upward and outward. Someone say upward and outward. Tell your other neighbor next to you, say, hey, I didn't hear you loud enough. Upward and outward. <laughs> it's important. Now, let's give you a little bit of background there in Psalms 57. First of all, of course, it was written by David, and he's hiding in a cave. When's the last time you hid in a cave? Come on. How many even like going in caves? Anybody here? When we were in Hawaii and stuff, there's comes caves, and we started to go in some caves that... Sister Paula didn't go very far. But, you know, you go into caves and, you know, and I've been in a bunch of different caves in Missouri. We have a whole bunch of caves there and stuff, and they're pretty cool. You can be so far underground, it can, it's so cool, like, it's very cool. I don't really like the caves that only have a small enough for the body to go through. That's just not my enjoyment. But I don't go to caves to relax. Hey, I need some relax today. I guess I'm going to go into a cave. You go into a cave to hide. You go into a cave for protection. The underground church would go into caves so that no one could hear them worship or get away from things it's to hide. David's in a cave trying to hide from Saul. I want you to get this. This is important for you and I to, to know what's going on in the life of David. Because David is having it tough, and he's writing this lament, and it's called a, a, a mitkam. And, and, and a mitkam really means, it, the title is, it's a type of psalm it is, and it says, destroy not. And it's really talking about this psalm expresses these ingredients. Emotion, uh, trust, the refuge, and praise. That's the type of psalm this is. And he's expressing praise, watch this, in the midst of some pain. Let me say that again. He's exhibiting some praise in the midst of some pain. When you feel pain, when you feel aggravated, when you feel lowly, when you feel stressed, uh, when you feel that, you know what, no one really gives a rip, how do you feel? Yeah. You feel lousy. You like sometimes you just, sometimes when I have moments like that I just want to go to bed. Yeah. Lord, I'm going to start a new day. Just go to bed. Yeah. Here's the thing, David is praising God. He's in a cave and he's praising God and we're going to look at his heart because when you look at the prayers of the Bible, you get to hear the insight of a person's heart as they confess or as they profess before God. It's a beautiful thing. But your prayer can be just as beautiful before the Lord when you take your heart and you connect to the Lord. Prayer is powerful. And we're going to look at prayer in David's prayer. David could have questioned God. Instead, he went and he had a quest to seek God. Now, he could have been in that cave pacing, you know. Man, I can't believe you did this to me, God. I, I just, I've been doing this for you, doing this. And look, this is how you thank me? Some of us know exactly what that walk's all about. But some would say, God's not done yet. You see, sometimes we're going through the situation and God's not done yet, but we have to stay close to the Lord. We have to continue to pray, continue to seek him, because sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. That's what testimonies are made out of. Instead of wondering what God was doing, he chose, he chose to just pursue God and start to recognize the goodness of God. Our world is in chaos. Continue to be in chaos. And as I say that, I want you to continue to pray for Israel. God has done so much for Israel. So many things. It's amazing on what's been taking place and but that, that's not the story. It's not over yet. But there's tsunamis and storms and earthquakes. And look at the floods that we just had there in Florida. Total devastation that took place. Now, these are things in our world. And th unfortunately, these things will increase according to Matthew chapter 24. 
I want you to understand something. When the tough time comes, when, it's not if, it's when they come. Are we going to be people who are going to know how to trust God in the midst of the pressure, in the midst of the pain? Are we going to really know God, know him, or are we just going to know the Bible verses? Because it doesn't matter about Bible verses. You see, where your Christianity maturity shows up is when you're going through the mess, when you're in the fire, you can still know your God's in the fire. Amen. You see, it's easy just to say, yeah, I'm a believer. You know, it, it, you show your, you shine you're the believer when all of a sudden you're living it out and you're trusting them, you're trusting them even in the mess. You're going to know God's going to bless. He will. David knew where to go when he is in trials. Every single chapter, everything that David faced was bringing him to another destination. He first had to conquer the lion, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. And then he got Goliath. And then from Goliath, took on a, God protected him over an army. And all of a sudden, everything he learned in this time. Remember, I preached many years ago about how God took him to king school. He never took Saul to king school. But he took David to king school. And David learned how to trust the Lord in the process. David knew where to go in trial. David knew the character and the promise of God. David created a life. Watch this. Watch this. A, communi- a life of communication in prayer with God. Throughout everything he faced. He, he had a trust. He carried a trust, totally reliant, totally resting upon the Savior's timing. David found, many times, found himself in caves. He found this himself in Gedi, a dulum. And in these times, there were different things that took place in a cave as he was hiding from King Saul. Let's go and look at the verse here. Let's go ahead and look at David's prayer. David here is going to be first start off and asking for mercy. It says verse 1, Have mercy on me, O God, have mercy on me, for, for in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. I want you to get that for a moment. He's saying, God, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. I want you to look how that end verse ends he says until this disaster has passed someone say he had some faith see he's praying but he's also seeing what god's going to do god hasn't done it yet but he's believing god's going to do it because he knew who god was and when the more you know the character of god it will help you when you're going through your stress of life because you know who i you know that you know that you know that you know i remember when god called me I was not school type right didn't like school cheated mainly my four years in high school thank you Paula and um, graduated in my trade top of the notch though I never took my academics good but my trade I went into competition with my trade and won some awards in my trade but not in my academics I cheated my, mainly the four years I was in high school. And so when I went to college, boy, did I struggle. But I, I say this to say this is that God, God wants to do something in you in the process of things. And you need to know that, that when you don't learn the things you're supposed to do, life is tough. And so if you don't learn it and you go through a trial, guess what? You're going to really struggle because you don't know that you know that you know. You don't really know because you won't spend no time in the Word. The, the Word's not getting in you, so the Word can't come out of you. You can't give what you don't have. You, you don't know something until you know something, and we don't spend no time with God. How are we going to have a deep relationship with Him? You can't live on yesterday's old bread. You don't do that at home when you eat, do you? Hey, go, go, to, go to the bread box. I know that bread's about a month old, but, you know, it was, good, it was good a month ago. We don't do that with our physical food. Don't do it with your spiritual food. You see, so David's asking for mercy, and mercy is simply this. God not giving to you what you deserve. Thank God. Someone say, thank God for mercy. God not giving to you. Or you not giving someone else something they deserve. You know, if they hurt you, you're like, yeah, I'm going to hurt you right back. 
You said something mean to me, I'm going to say something mean to you back. And I'm going to, I'm going to even do better, be meaner. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you showed someone mercy? How about this? You're driving down the road. Mm. You know where I'm going, huh? Driving down the road, and then all of a sudden someone cuts in front of you. And mercy overflows. <laughs> I mean, they can tell who you are. You're a Christian. Because the mercy just flows from you. It's okay. God bless you. You almost hit my car, but God bless you. Or maybe it's like, you jerk! I can't believe it! Get off the road! Which one is you? Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Because some of you, I already know the answer. So when's the last time you, you had mercy and you, you maybe feed the hungry, uh, you gave water to the thirsty, you clothed the naked, you sheltered the homeless, you visit the sick, you visit the imprisoned, you help somebody out financially? I know they don't deserve it. Yeah, none of us deserve it. We're working on a situation right now. The, the person got themselves in a mess. Mess. And sometimes people say, well, you know what? They should have da 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 Yeah, yeah. What if you do something and you mess up and we're going to take that same thing? Oh, no, you need to show me mercy. Be careful how quick you are to judge someone because you could be the next person in line that's going to need mercy and grace. Someone say amen. amen. So David is hiding in the cave and... He's very, he's having a stressful time. How many of you have ever been stressful one day in your life? Just stressful. You just feel stressed to a mess. Hmm? Egypt, do you ever get stressed? You ever get stressed, Egypt? Just one time? No. <laughs> I like how she said, no. See, David is stressed out, yet I think of this portion of scripture here, one of my favorites. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your what? Your request to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's a promise that God wants to do. I want you to understand something that in this portion of scripture, David asked for mercy twice. Twice. Have mercy on me. God heard the first time. Have mercy on me. Because it shows the intensity of his heart. He feels the pressure. And he's asking for God's favor. He's asking that God. And that word favor, the word favor is often found in a translation of mercy. There are some in scripture that will use the word favor instead of mercy. I like the word caress. Mercy is more important. Mercy, that word mercy. Favor is yes, when you get God's favor, you do have God's mercy. But mercy carries a, a definition that speaks great, loud. I want you to understand that mercy is a great gift, and God gave him mercy. Psalms 57, 51, 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. The word mercy appears 286 times in the New King James Bible. Every Bible has a different number of how many times mercy is um, spoken. Mercy is seen so much in the Old Testament and New Testament. And the Bible says, freely you receive, freely you what? Mercy are one of the things that you and I have received. God did not give you what you deserve. How many could say praise the Lord? Praise that day when you see Jesus face to face, you're going to know and that's if you have your sins forgiven. If you're still living in sin and doing your own thing in sin, then you, you're, you're going to be in trouble with God. You're accountable until you get it right. But there are some of us that are going to be with Jesus, and we're going to really get this whole new dimension about mercy and grace. Oh, God, thank you so much. Now that I'm here, oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, you'll be glad. God has a great thing. Let me tell you three things, three things about mercy. Three things about mercy. First, mercy is a central quality of God. It's one of the very important to God. God, that's who he is. He's peace. He's hope. He's mercy. It's his character. It's the central quality of God. 2 Corinthians 1.3, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of, all, of mercies and the God of all comfort. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich 
in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Someone say praise the Lord. First Peter 1 3 said, Blessed be the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his great mercy has regenerated us again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Can someone say praise the Lord? He lavishes the essential quality of God, mercy. So if it's God's quality and we are made in God's image and we are to be like Christ-like, should we not now carry mercy in our life with other people? Absolutely. Second, the second thing that I want you to understand about three things about mercy. Mercy was received from God and now we are required, we are required to give it to others. Someone say, ouch. Mm. Matthew 5, 7 says, blessed are the merciful. You're going to be blessed, for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew 10, 8 says, freely you have received. Freely you, you give. Mercy, mercy. And number three, number three, mercy and grace are usually read together in Scripture. You'll find this over, but I'm just giving you one, one Scripture here. 1 Timothy 1, 2. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, peace from God. The Father of Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, these are essentials. It was always a, you can always see mercy and grace being connected. So we need to have those things in our life. If we're going to go before God in prayer and we're going to say, God, we need your favor. We need your mercy. In your prayer, you need to show mercy. Because you think about this, if you're not kind over here to people, but you want God to be kind to you. Does that make sense? You want... God to be merciful to you, but you can't be merciful to others. Because his prayer is teaching us, even though he's crying out for his mercy, if you look at the end of, his, the, end of the message here in verse 1, he's believing that he's going to get what he's asking for. There's going to be a point here when God's going to do something great in him and through him and around him. It's important. Look at verse the last part there, I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Someone say that's faith beacon right there. You see, our prayer has to include the aspect of faith. In the midst of this problem, he is exhibiting trust and confidence in God. He's steady, but in the midst of calamity. In the midst of pressure, he's solid. Why is that? How can he be so solid when all around him is being rocked? He's lost everything. His family is gone. His wife isn't taken away from him. People have, been, people have died because of him. I mean, when you look at the life of David, he went through like crazy pain. And yet, he stood steady through the process. And in the midst of calamity, he was still trusting the Lord. I think it speaks to what we need to do. What caused him to do that? He created daily habits. Daily habits. Your daily habits will determine your journey of life. And one of the daily habits that David did, he learned to pray. He learned to pursue persistent prayer. He learned to pursue God and talked about it, commune with God. And because of that, he created habit of developing a healthy relationship of trust through his communication and knowing who God is in his word. So in his word, he then communicated to the Lord. Whatever you're going through today, whatever struggle you may have, you got to turn to the Lord. You got to, you have to start learning the word of God. Amen? Amen. You need to make new habit. You need to choose to run and not just for fun, but you need to choose to run to really Grab hold of what God has for you. You need to put the promise of God and make that your source, your real source of life. Not just reading your Bible like, like God, I read your Bible today. You must be proud of me. I want to tell you something. He's not really that proud of you reading the Bible. That's something you ought to do. That's like your son or daughter coming up to you and say, hey, dad, guess what? I took out the garbage today. Uh, I'm your best son. Son, you're supposed to take out the garbage. That's your chore. You know? Now, if he comes up to me and say, Dad, guess what? I washed your car today. No. And he don't supposed to wash my... And I cleaned it out, too. Now, that shows a whole different story. Amen? Amen. 
But if you're doing what you're supposed to do, that's just what you're supposed to do. It's like a person who, you know, let's suppose you have uh, 25 employees and, and they all have jobs to do. And at the end of the day, they come up to you and say, hey, just want to let you know, we did, what we, we did everything today. We did everything you told us to do. Good. That's what you get paid for. I'm expecting that. I don't think any boss would, would, would want a person to say, uh, yeah, I came into work today, but I didn't do nothing I was supposed to do, but I'm a good employee. I care about this company. You do. Well, if you care about the company, do something about it. So that's exactly what the bottom line is. So I want you to say, start reading your Bible because you want to grow in God. Get hungry. Be a hungry hippo. Look at verse 2 and 3. I cry out to the Lord Most High, to God, who fulfills his purpose for me. He sends from heaven and saves me, rebuking those who hotly pursue me. God sends his love and his faithfulness. I want you to, to get this. Selah, in just a case with those, means pause and rest, but I'm, I'm just trying to save you a little bit of time. <laughs> David's crying out to the Lord. <clears throat> He's in a tough spot, but he's crying out to the Lord. David knows who God is most high. He's the only place he's going to run to. He knew God is supreme. God is over it all. How many of you have a problem, and instead of going to God, you go, to, you go outward this way? Watch this. Got a problem. Hold on for a minute. I dropped my phone. Hello? Sister, sister, sister Ann? I, you, I gotta tell you what just happened. Well, what? Have I told God? Oh, no. What? Okay. She told me to talk to God before I talked to her. Best advice you could ever get. Amen. Nothing wrong with going horizontal, but first take it vertical. David did that. That's what made him who he was. He didn't have many people to go around, and when he's in this situation, he has nobody that he can really trust but the Lord. He did have a few people along the line that were very trustworthy, especially as he became king. But he knew God was supreme, not Saul. Saul may want to try to kill him, but what can man do when we trust the Lord? He is over everything, including every despairing moment we have. But you have to give him your problems. You have to give him your pain. You have to release it. You really have to release, because if you don't, it will eat you up on the inside. Get this. Write this down. Because David knew, one, he was not alone. David knew the power of God. David knew God saw his troubles. Sometimes we don't think God sees our troubles. God sees you right where you are. God, he knew God was with him. He knew God would provide. He knew that God would bring a resolve to the present problem. He knew because he knew who God was. I want to tell you something here. How many remember Romans 8.28? How many know that scripture? 8.28. Who knows it? If you know it, raise your hand. Romans 8.28. Watch this. And we know that all things God works for good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Let me read that again. For we know that in all things, in all things, God works for good, the good. For the good. Amen. But pastor, why did that happen? I don't know. That was painful. I know. That was hurtful. Yeah, I know. But God works all things for the good. If you stay in there. Amen. There are so many things that took place in David's life that he would say not good. When the priests at Nob were all killed, that was not good. He felt so guilty because... He, they all got killed because of him. And not just the priest, but the, the whole area. They, he, Saul killed everybody because of one priest giving him aid. It was a rough life. But in the midst of it all, David sees the faithfulness of God. David knows God is the only one that can help him. God is the only one that can help you for the most part. David knows God is the only one that can protect him in this case is absolutely true. David knows that God is the only place that he could direct his plea. You got a problem? 
Got a problem? How many got a problem right now? Just you got a problem. Got a problem. I have, I need more hands to put them up. But yeah, got a problem. Okay, one, at least one problem. God's the only answer to your problem. But how often do you tell him your problem? Do not say this. Oh, Lord, I, I tell you my problems, but I don't want to bother you with small things. Do you know how insulting that is to say to God when God wants to hear your very heart? God wants to hear from you. He cares about your voice. He cares about you. You know what? He, he, he wants to hear from you. It's called prayer. Not like you're, going, you're not taken up. People sometimes say to me, I don't want to waste your time, Pastor. And, and I say to them all the time, listen. You are my day and time. You call me, you have a need, we're going to take care of this right now. But the next person calls me and I'm talking here, I cannot take care of this because I'm going to be, I am one person at a time. But I will give that one person my own, my, all my divided attention when, that, when it needs so. God, and it, God wants to hear from you. Very attentive with everybody out there. When you call on his name, you got a one-on-one. -on -one. Come on, someone say one-on-one. -on -one. Can you believe it? One-on-one. -on -one. Mm. Maybe you're in a cave right now. Maybe you're in a situation. Maybe you're in a circumstance. Maybe there's something that just is not the way you want it. Well, are you taking it to God? Are you carrying the pain? Are you carrying the frustration? Are you carrying the hurt? Or are you really giving it to God? And do you have faith that God's going to be working out the problem, working out the problem, just like David is saying? I'm going gonna, gonna, gonna to continue to trust you until you bring this disaster to a, a close. David can teach us his heart was to seek God and our heart is to seek God. It should be. It's the heart of the servant. Listen to what he wrote here in 63, Psalm 63, 3 and 4. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I mean, are you really all in with God? Or do you want God just to bless you? But when it comes to you to sacrifice, when it comes to you to give, when it comes to you to, you know, reach someone, help someone, teach someone, invest your life in someone eternally wise, I mean, what are we doing? Our life is to be invested. We only have one life to live, one life. I can tell you, I can only share for me, but I, I gave up my life a long time ago. I gave up my life a long time ago. I'm one life. I have a little saying, but it's more than a saying. I'm living here to make a difference there. I've had a few friends call me up and say, hey, hey, Pastor Brian, hey, uh, how you doing? Can I, um, can I borrow your slogan? I said, no, I have it copyrighted and... Uh, <laughs> And they laugh about it, but I have had that few phone calls. They, they, but to me, it, it's my reason of living. I'm not here to make a big difference for me. God will take care of that. God knows my heart. God provided something I've been wanting for a long time. I finally got my boat. I like my boat. I like my boat a lot. And by the way, I'm going to let you know right now. I got it all done, just got to get it printed out, but the boat is called visitation. So when you call the church office, I'm letting you know now, and say, pastor's on visitation, I'm going around seeing people. Just letting you know right now. <laughs> That's like vacation for me, being on the boat. You see, David is crying out to Most High. He's, it, it's crying out to El Shaddai. And Al Shaddai is all sufficient one. I want you to get this. The, the word, uh, what he calls God, El Shaddai, all sufficient one. It's, it's beautiful. It's, it's understanding that, that, that God, your God, will meet all your needs. He's the one capable of meeting all your needs. He, he is all sufficient. It's important that you and I know this. Let me, close, let me land the plane. David's present problem, he describes his present problem, and when he describes it, he's so full of details. I love it. Look what it says. I am in the midst of lions. I lie among ravenous beasts, men whose teeth are spears and arrows, whose tongues are sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over the earth. I want you to look at the company he's in. Not the company you want to hang around with. These are these are people who want to hurt you. 
And David is surrounded. But he also, also knows there was a man named Daniel. Does anybody know a little bit about Daniel? Yeah, we all know that he was a bunch of, with lions. What did the angel do for the lion? He shut the mouth of the lion. Someone say, my God can. You see, your God can, but do you believe it when you go through the pressures? Do you really believe it? Or you listen to everybody says, and you get away from the word of God. The word of God is what we need. How about, how about Joseph when he went to prison? Joseph was alone when he went to prison. There was no, not a lot of cheerleaders for him in prison. But he knew God. And he had a vision from God. He had a dream from God. And that dream went deep into his heart. And because he had a dream, he kept that dream. And that dream fed him in the difficult, lonely nights. And God was showing up and showing off in his life. How about the three Hebrew children, Meshach, Shavuot, and Abednego? I mean, you know what? Tell Nebuchadnezzar. And even if our God doesn't save us, which he can, we're still not going to serve you, O king. Man, did they not know God? I mean, they opened their mouth because they knew who they were. And they were so all in that if their life ended there, they were not going to displease their God. That's someone in it to win it. That's all God's looking for, people to be in it to win it. So he's saying he's in the midst of lions, ravenous beasts, teeth like spears and arrows. These are wicked men. And he describes them, and it's really King Saul. It's the army of Israel. It's people who want to see his downfall. And he's describing the weapons that are designed to destroy him through people's actions, through people's words. And, you know, when you're around a lion, what does the lion want to do? He wants to eat you. Huh? I mean, you go into a lion cage, and that kind of lion hasn't eaten. He wants to eat you. People, you know, it goes on to say um, teeth, spears, and arrows, things that people were saying, lies that were spreading. But listen to verse 5. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. God, I'm, I'm surrounded by all these tools and all these evil people who are trying to bring me hurt. But you know what, God? May your name be praised. Do you see the depths of a relationship David had? Do you know why God called him a man after his own heart? I don't know about you, but do you want your faith to increase? Do you want to be more? Don't tell me I've been living. You say, well, pastor, I, I've been serving the Lord for 60 years. That's great. But are you increasing in your faith in those years? It's not how long you've been in the church. It's what you're doing for the church, his church, his word. I don't know. I just know my, my latter days are better than my former days. Pray that something happens inside me that the fire of God would burn where I become more uh, of a vessel for God because God wants to do a great work. He's able. Why don't we believe him for big things? If he's so big, what problem do you put a hindrance on him for? Oh, my God's big. Got a problem. Oh, no. What are we going to do? Oh, my. Sometimes we don't know what to do. That's when we trust and don't rust. Let me close. You see, it's so important that we need to trust God. Uh, we need to, when we're down and when we're, we're feeling the pressure, uh, we, we need to go to God in prayer. Don't, don't say, well, God's not with me. Don't, don't think it's, it's, it's God has left me. How about this? How about this? Maybe you've left God. You know, an old couple driving down the street. They've been married for 70 years. And, and she looks over to him and says, Dear, you know, I've been thinking, things are not the same anymore. When we first got together, you were right by my side. You, you, I, I would come over to you, and you would drive, and we would be together and stuff. Every time we drive, dear, you know, we were always side by side. And the man driving the car said, I haven't moved, dear. I haven't moved. And sometimes we're the one moving, and yet we want to blame it on God. I want to say, be like the heart of David. Let's be open. Let's get an appetite to believe God for great things. Let's really start to cry out again with faith and believe God, that God's going to work a great work in us and through us and around us. Let's really believe what God has said. He will lavish his mercy upon us. He has given us his grace 
It's up to you and I to go to God in prayer and pursue him, even in the problems, even with the pressure, but to pursue. Give a time of the day and and, uh, where you're going to meet with God on a daily basis. And so you meet with God on a continuous basis. And when you meet with God on a continuous basis, he's going to grow your faith. He's going to grow you up. It's like a relationship. We want good relationships, but every good relationship takes time. And the person who takes the time is the person who loves the one who they take the time for. Did you catch that? What happens horizontally is the same that happens vertically between you and God. Let's go to God with prayer, with a grateful heart. Let's really understand that God wants us to totally rely upon Christ, upon our saviors. I want you to know that he has perfect timing in you and for you. And this could be a time right now that you may look in and say, you know what, God, I really want to be a man like David. I want to be a woman that shows the characteristics of David. I really want to be that person. Why don't you stand your feet with us for me for a second? I want you to think about situations you've gone through. I want you to think about something that's hard. I want you to think about some things that take place in your life that's hurtful. When those things come, do you communicate to God and say, God, though I'm in this mess, I'm going to praise you. Or do we sometimes forget what we should be doing? We don't carry that that David's heart there. I'm going to press in, I'm going to press in. Maybe you're online, maybe you're here today. And first of all, you never accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. I mean, this is the first thing, to, to make sure God is your Savior. He died on the cross for you. You have to... You have to, the journey starts with making Jesus first, first. He loves you. Look at your neighbor and say he loves you. Don't forget the people out there that need to hear it. Jesus loves them. Jesus so loved you that he stretched out his arms and died for you. And if you have not yet said, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, come into my life, I choose to be your child. I accept what you did upon the cross. I believe you died for me on the cross. You rose on the third day. Defeat death, sin, and the grave. And I now commit my heart to you. That's the most beautiful prayer that you can change your life. Someone say amen. 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 How many of you today would say that you really need to walk in a deeper faith with God? There's problems come sometimes and you let the problems really kind of get you and, and kind of just suck you dry a little bit. And yeah, I see the hands, a lot of hands. Yeah, and, and that's, that's, that's normal, but that's when you've got to pursue God in prayer, persistent prayer. That's when you really have to say, you know, I'm not going to let my problem dictate my day. I'm not going to let my problem dictate my choices. I'm not going to allow my problem to dictate how I'm going to shine, God, because I know you're going to work it out. Someone say he's going to work it out. Let's pray. Those that raise your hands, lift your hands to heaven. Father, I just ask right now that you would touch each individual here, God. I pray, Lord, that you would help us. God, when we feel the pressure and we feel the pain, Lord, I just ask right now that you, Lord, would help each one here draw closer to you. As David was in the cave praying, And even though there are so many out to get him and kill him and destroy the plan you have for his life, I pray right now, Lord, that you rise up. And Lord, you show yourself strong in every single life here, God, as they yield their heart to you. Father, and they get serious about their walk with you. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Give you God, give you give some God praise to God. Give you give some praise to God. Well, we thank you for joining us today. Let's continue to believe that God is going to do a work in all of our lives and in his church, despite our current circumstances. If you would like to support the ministry of Salem First Assembly, you can do so by mailing to 430 Route 45, Salem, New Jersey, 08079, or by visiting our website 
at salemfirstag.org. Please join us for service next Sunday at 10.30 a.m., or you can watch service every Sunday afternoon on Facebook at Salem First Assembly or YouTube at Salem First AG. You can also listen to the message every Tuesday on Podbean. Have a blessed rest of your day. Let's remember to be a blessing and that life is living in faith every day.